This is Global News and Zuma Nigeria. I am Lois Jureki and you are welcome. Our top stories, Myanmar regime calls major ethnic armed groups terrorists. Fugitive ex-Philippines Mayor Alice Gu arrested in Indonesia. U.S. strategies Hamas leaders of October 7th affects Gaza mediation. U.S. woman indicted for trying to drown three-year-old girl and Ukraine undergoes major reshuffle amid critical war phase. Stay with me for these and more stories. The Myanmar military has labelled three major ethnic armed groups that have advanced across swaths of northern and western Myanmar over the past year as terrorist groups. According to reports on Wednesday, the designation was made on September 2nd and applied to the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army MDAA, Tang National Liberation Army TNLA, and Arakan Army AA. Under the Artin Terror terror law membership and contact with groups labeled terrorist organizations are barred those who contact these terrorists are also committing terror act report quoted senior general me and liang who chairs the military state administration council saka saying the armed groups established the three brotherhood alliance to launch a major offensive towards the end of last year that has given fresh momentum to efforts to remove the generals who seize power in a february 2021 coup the fighters have progressed in parts of Myanmar bordering China and Thailand, as well as in far western Rakhine, where conflict research firm Crisis Group said at the end of August, the Arakan Army AA seemed to be in the control of territory with a population of around 1 million people. People's Defense Forces, DPDFs, civilians who have taken up arms against the military, have also advanced notably in the central Mandalay region. In 2021, the PDFs were set up by the National Unity Government, NUJ, of elected politicians and activists after the military reacted to mass protests with force. The SAC called the NUG a terrorist group in May 2021. The NUG refers to the military as terrorists. The Arakan Army, which, like the military, has been accused of rights abuses, was earlier designated a terrorist organization by the elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi. The military removed the designation two months after the coup, saying the group with which it then had a ceasefire was helping to establish peace. The truce later broke down. 5,599 people have been killed since the coup, while over 20,000 are being held in prison. The Assistance Association for Political Prisoners, a local monitoring group, says. Talking judicial matters, a former mayor in the Philippines, Alice Guo, accused of connections to Chinese criminal syndicates, has been apprehended in Indonesia. The Ministry of Justice and Guo, who also has Chinese nationality and goes by the name Go Han Ping, is wanted by the Philippine Senate for refusing to attend a congressional investigation into her alleged criminal ties. She has detained the allegations, insisting she is a natural-born Philippine citizen facing malicious accusations. The Justice Department statement said, This development has been verified by our counterparts in immigration who have confirmed that Ms. Go is presently in the custody of the Indonesian police. Go, the ex-mayor of Ban Ban town about 100 kilometers 62 miles north of Manila, was arrested at 11.58 p.m. on Tuesday in Tangeran City in Jakarta. Last month, Philippine law enforcement agencies, including the Anti-Money Laundry Council, jointly filed several counts of money laundering against Guo and 35 others before the Department of Justice. The AMLC has alleged that Guo and her court conspirators laundered over 100 million pesos, that's 1.8 million US dollars in proceeds from criminal activities. Lawyer Stephen David Guo's counsel on record did not immediately respond to requests for comment. Justice Secretary Boye Rebella said in a statement, according to a report in the Philippines, that the arrest of Alice Guo in a, is a testament to the tireless efforts of our law enforcement agencies and the strength of the international cooperation in bringing fugitives to justice. Guo, who was removed from office as mayor, fled the country in July, traveling first to Malaysia and Singapore, and then to Indonesia using her Philippine passport, the Philippine Anti-Crime Agency has said. The scene has started a probe into her activities in May, two months after authorities raided a casino in Bamban town and uncovered what law enforcement officials said were scams being perpetrated 
from a facility built on land partially owned by the mayor. The discovery triggered a public outcry and Philippine President Ferdinand Marcus Jr. later ordered a ban on online gaming operators over their suspected connections to organized crime. Marcus has pledged to go after those who aided in her flight. Authorities believe there could be several hundred illegal online gambling entities running scam centers under the noses of public officials. Still talking judicial matters, the United States Justice Department has announced criminal charges against top leaders of Hamas over their roles in the October 7th attacks in southern Israel in what some see as a hugely symbolic step against the Palestinian organization. In the complaint unsealed on Tuesday, six defendants, three of whom are deceased, were named. The deceased defendants are former Hamas political chief Ismail Haniyeh, who was assassinated in July in Tehran, Mohammed Daif, who was killed in an Israel airstrike on Gaza in July, and Marwan Isa, who Israel has said it killed in an attack in March. The living defendants are Hamas's new leader, Yaya Senwar, who is believed to be in Gaza, Khaled Marshall, who is based in Doha and heads the group's diaspora office, and Ali Baraka, a senior Hamas official based in Lebanon. Those defendants, armed with weapons, political support and funding from the government of Iran and support from Hezbollah, have led Hamas's efforts to destroy the state of Israel and murder civilians in support of that aim, U.S. Attorney General Mary Gallen said in a statement. The U.S. charges come the White House says it is developing a new ceasefire and captive deal proposal with its Egyptian and Qatari counterparts to try to bring an end to fighting in Gaza. U.S. politics, Canada's multiculturalism, South America's geopolitical rise, we bring you the stories that matter. Rami Khoury, a distinguished fellow at the American University of Peru, said according to a report that the U.S. decision to charge the Hamas leaders hurts its role as a mediator in the ongoing ceasefire talks. The United States has been heavily, enthusiastically and vigorously supporting Israel in its present actions in Gaza in what the United Nations calls a plausible genocide and it has long opposed groups like Hamas and Hezbollah designating them as terrorist groups, Corey said, from the U.S. city of Boston. The step to charge the Palestinian group also shows the United States is very keen to hold Hamas responsible for its actions but has no similar desire to hold Israel accountable for its actions, Curry said. And therefore, in the eyes of most of the world, the United States is not an honest broker but is complicit in the Israeli genocide in Gaza, he added. U.S. prosecutors said they brought charges against the six men in February but kept the complaint under seal in hopes of capturing Hania, according to a report attributing that information to a Justice Department official. According to more reports, after Hania's killing in the Iranian capital in an assassination blamed on Israel, the Justice Department decided to go public with the charges. Still dwelling with judicial matters, a woman in Texas, United States, has been officially indicted by a grand jury in the attempted drowning of a three-year-old Palestinian-American girl earlier this year that police said was motivated by racial hatred. According to records that came to light on Tuesday, the suspect, identified as Elizabeth Wolf, age 42, was charged by a grand jury in Tarrant County in an indictment filed last month that included a hate crime enhancement. Wolf, whose representative could not be immediately reached for comment, was charged with attempted capital murder of a person under 10 years of age and intentionally causing bodily injury to a child. The hate crime element of the indictment may raise the severity of Wolf's sentence if she is found guilty. The attack in May happened at an ap apartment complex swimming pool in Dallas Fort Worth suburb of Euless, according to a police report. The mother was able to pull her daughter from the water police said and local medics responded to the scene and the children were medically cleared. Earlier this year, the Council on American Islamic Relations, Texas, said the accused approached the mother of the children with racist interrogations and then grabbed the children who were in the shallow end of the pool and pulled them into the deep end in the alleged drowning attempt. Human rights advocates have cautioned that while gro growing threats against Palestinian Americans, Muslims, Arabs and Jews since the beginning of Israel's war on Gaza. 
Three Palestinian men in, er in their early 20s in late November were shot near a university campus in Vermont in the United States, wounding all three of them. A month earlier, a six-year-old Palestinian-American boy was stabbed to death in Illinois. Police charged a 71-year-old man with murder and a hate crime for stabbing the child to death and seriously injuring his mother. The elderly attacker targeted the victims as a response to the war in Gaza and their religion, according to the police. Away from judicial matters now to Ukraine. In Ukraine, a major shake-up of the government is underway after at least seven ministers resigned and the presidential aide was fired. Among those who quit late on Tuesday and early on Wednesday were Minister of Foreign Affairs Dmitry Kuleba, who alongside President Volodymyr Zelensky has led the drive to maintain Western backing and Minister for Strategic Industries Alexander Commission, who was in charge of weapons production. Deputy Prime Minister Oha Stefanishina, as well as the Justice, Environment and Reintegration Ministers also resigned, as did the head of Ukraine State Property Fund, Vatily Koval. Around a third of the positions in the cabinet are now vacant. Zelensky, who was elected in 2019, indicated last week he planned a major reshuffle in his regular evening address, he reiterated the need for a change. A decree on the president's website showed he had also fired Rostislav Sherman, a deputy chief of staff who handles the economy. The shakeup comes at a crucial point in the war against Russian forces advancing on the Eastern Front. Zelensky is due to travel to the United States, a key ally this month, where he's expected to outline his victory plan to President Joe Biden. David Arakmaya, a senior lawmaker for the ruling party, said over half of the ministers in government were likely to change. On Wednesday morning, Kuleba attended his union, according to Parliament Speaker Ruslan Stefanshuk, who said that the resignation request will be discussed by lawmakers. Appointed in 2020 since the Russian invasion in February 2022, Kuleba has been at the forefront of Kiev's drives to engage with international allies, secure new partnerships, and carry financial and military support. Citing unnamed sources, according to a report from Ukraine on Tuesday, that the foreign minister will be among the casualties. Deputy Foreign Minister Andriy Siba is believed to be the front runner to replace him. Commission, who was appointed in March 2023 and considered a rising star in the government, led Ukraine's effort to increase production of weaponry from attack drones to long-range missiles. Among stories, Russian strike kills dozens at Ukraine military site. According to Ukraine's Prosecutor General's Office, a Russian attack against a military educational facility in central Ukraine killed 51 people and wounded over 200 others in one of the deadliest single attacks since the start of Moscow's full-scale invasion in February 2022. President Volodymyr Zelensky said preliminary information showed two ballistic missiles hit the facility in the city of Poltava and a nearby hospital on Tuesday morning. We say again and again to everyone in the world who has the power to stop this terror, air defense systems and missiles are needed in Ukraine, not somewhere in a warehouse, Zelensky said in a statement. Philip Pronin, the head of the Poltava Region Military Administration, announced the newest death toll on adding that rescue crews continue to clear and search through the debris at the site. Pronin said authorities believe up to 18 more people may be under the rubble. No less than 10 residential buildings were also destroyed in Poltava, he said. Moscow has not commented on the attack, but a well-known Russian military blogger, Vladimir Rogov, reported earlier on Tuesday that Russia hit a military school in Moltava. Speaking about the attack, President Zelensky repeated his call on Ukraine's Western allies to supply Kiev with more air defenses and lift restrictions on his country's military using the weapons to strike inside Russia. Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba said, according to a report, that the missile reached the target in a very short time. People were struck down as they were trying to get into the bomb shelter, officials said. Ukraine has received a handful of Patriot air defense systems from the United States and Germany, although Kiev has consistently said the number was inadequate to let it to efficiently defend itself. In June, the Biden administration said it was prioritizing critical air defense capabilities for Ukraine 
over other countries and show Ukraine's survival. But Kleber made it clear on Tuesday that new weapons cannot come soon enough. I don't know about how many tragedies like this have to occur for all promises to be fulfilled and for all new commitments to be made, Kleber added, reiterating Zelensky's calls for more defense systems to be sent to Ukraine. On Tuesday, local authorities said it was a terrible day for Poltava and declared three days of mourning. No more details will be released about the strike due to security issues, they said. Ukrainian First Lady Olena Zelenska described the attack as a terrible tragedy for the whole of Ukraine as Western allies condemned the scale and force of the Russian strike. David Lamy, British Foreign Secretary, paid tribute to those killed. Russia's strikes on Poltava are the latest sickening act of aggression in Putin's abhorrent and illegal war in Ukraine, he said on Tuesday. We stand with Ukraine. Now in African shows, Uganda's Bobby Wine shot injured in Kampala clash. Bobby Wine, Uganda's major opposition leader who has appeared as the most formidable opponent of veteran president, Yoweri Museveni, has been shot in the leg by security agents in a northern suburb of the capital, Kampala. His party said, Bobby Wine, a single turned politician whose real name is Robert Kiagulani, finished runner-up in the 2021 presidential election behind Museveni, who has ruled the East African country for closely 40 years. His party, the National Unity Platform, said on Tuesday that security operatives have made an attempt on his life. They added he was shot in the leg and seriously injured. The police said officers had tried to block Bobby Wine and his team from marching down a road, resulting in an altercation in which he was wounded a probe will be conducted to clarify the facts, the police said in a statement. Police officers on site claim he stumbled while getting into his vehicle, causing the injury, whereas Honorable Kia Gulaini and his team assert that he was shot, the police said. NUP Party Secretary General David Lewis Rubogoya said, We condemn this cowardly action, yet another attempt on his life. The continuing violence meted out on those opposed to the Museveni regime must be condemned by all people of good conscience. Museveni's government has been accused by opponents and human rights activists of stifling the opposition, something Museveni refutes. On Tuesday, according to reports, a U.S. State Department spokesperson said Washington was concerned that violence against opposition voices means the democratic space continues to shrink in Uganda. Bobby Wine has amassed huge backing among the youth in Uganda, a nation of 46 million people, with several wooed initially by his rocks to reach his story as a pop star from the ghetto in recent years by his bold criticism of Museveni's government. Now on China-Africa cooperation, a model for shared growth. A high-ranking Chinese diplomat responsible for African ties stated on Tuesday that China and Africa will cooperate closely to protect the interests of developing nations against the growing tide of hegemonism and a Cold War mindset. Louis Yuxi, China's Special Envoy for African Affairs, announced on Tuesday that the 2024 Forum on China-Africa Cooperation for CAC Summit will implement an action plan aimed at enhancing collaboration in global governance, security, trade and investment over the next three years. He stated that China and Africa complement each other well in terms of development strengths. Africa boasts abundant natural resources and a huge population which is experiencing fast urbanization. China, meanwhile, is focused on reforming and modernizing its development model. The country is also forming a new development framework and stressing high quality growth. China possesses advantages in capital, technology and developmental experience. The cooperation between China and Africa is both mutually beneficial and complementary. Africa leaders have arrived in Beijing for the Fukak Summit hosted by Chinese President Xi Jinping from today to the 6th of September. China stands as Africa's biggest trading partner and a major source of investment, while Africa plays a vital role in Xi's ambitions belt and road initiative. Louis highlighted that China-Africa cooperation exemplifies multilateralism and is not exclusive. The continent's speedily growing population, abundant natural resources and significant voting power in the United Nations make it essential to world powers. As the U.S. shifts its foreign policy to focus more on China,
which the Biden administration views as its primary economic and military rival, Lewis stated Africa should no longer be a battleground for major powers. He urged the international community to consider Africa's perspective on back its peace and development. Louis emphasized the strong economic complementarity between China and Africa, noting Africa's rich resources and demographic, demographic advantages alongside China's strengths in capital, technology and development experience. We take a quick break and when we come back, more stories from Nigeria. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Stories from Nigeria. Now we begin with NNPCL sets petrol price at 897 Naira per litre as Dangote products to enter market. The retail arm of the Nigerian National Petroleum Company has announced a surge in the price of premium motor spirit known as petrol from 617 Naira per litre to 897 Naira per litre effective yesterday, September 3, 2024. This is coming barely 48 hours of Dangote Refinery's plan to distribute its petrol in Nigeria's market. According to a report on Tuesday, most retail stations of the NNPCL had adjusted to the new price of between 855 Naira to 897 Naira per litre. The chairman of Dangote Group, Aliko Dangote, has announced that the refined petrol from the refinery will be distributed in the Nigerian market in less than 48 hours. He explained that the refinery has sufficient capacity to satisfy the petrol demand of not just Nigeria but the whole sub-Saharan region of Africa. The fuel price is being increased for the third time since the beginning of President Tinubu-led administration in 2023. Upon assumption of office in May 2023, President Tinubu announced the removal of fuel subsidy which led to the addition in transportation and hardship for numerous Nigerians as the prices of goods and services surged significantly. Following the President's announcement, fuel price jumped from 197 Naira per litre to between 480 Naira and 570 Naira per litre. Also in July 2023, the petrol price was again increased to 617 Naira per litre at various outlets of the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited and in PCL, while independent marketers sold the product for as high as 800 Naira per litre. However, the newest review follows the recent disclosure made by the NNPCL stating that the cost of supplying petrol was putting financial strain on the company. This, it said, poses a threat to the sustainability of fuel supply in the country. And finally, on the news, mass burial for 34 Yobe villagers killed by Boko Haram. On Tuesday, no fewer than 34 Yobe villagers killed on Sunday in a Sunday raid by Boko Haram terrorists in Mafa village were given a mass burial. The victims were buried at Babangida, the headquarters of the Termua local government area of Yobe state. The villagers said more than 100 persons were killed. The state government said the casualties figure was 34. The dead bodies were recovered in a search and rescue operation led by the Nigerian army and supported by local vigilantes. Villagers asserted that its six dead bodies were found in the surrounding communities of Mafa village following the terror attack, during which many houses were raised by the insurgents. The dead bodies were pre prepared for burial by the volunteers of the Nigerian Red Cross Society, Babangida Division, under the supervision of the Divisional Secretary, Gariba Bulama Kachala. Dungus Aldo Karim, the spokesperson for the Yobe State Police Command, had on Monday in an interview confirmed the terror attack on the Mafa village in the Tarumua local government area of Yobe State. Abdul Karim said though the police had not ascertained the casualty figure, the attackers killed several villagers and destroyed many houses in the community. The Yobe State Deputy Governor Idi Gubana led a state government delegation on a visit to the community where he donated 30 million naira to the families of the victims on Tuesday. However, the deputy governor said the casualty figure was 34. He condoled with the emir of Jajare May Mashio and the people of the area over the dastardly act. 
Kubana directed the State Emergency Management Agency to provide shelter and food items for the displaced persons who lost all their belongings as a result of the attack. He stated that the state governor, May Malabuni, who was utterly devastated by the killings, had visited the chief of defense staff, General Christopher Musa, over sustainable security in Mafa. Another look at the top stories. Myanmar regime calls major ethnic armed groups terrorists. Fugitive ex-Philippines Mayor Alice Goa arrested in Indonesia. U.S. charges Hamas leaders over October 7th affects Gaza mediation. U.S. woman indicted for trying to drown three-year-old girl. And Ukraine undergoes major reshuffle amid critical war phase. That's all on the news. Thanks for watching. Till next time.